Just a, a, some thoughts here on Aaron Schwartz. I wanted to share this with you. Uh, first of all, here's a, a clip from our program of Aaron Schwartz. You get a sense of, of who, who this guy is. Your listeners may remember, SOPA and PIPA were these bills that would allow the government to censor websites on the Internet. And they were pushed by the entertainment industry, especially by Hollywood, in order to allow them to shut down sites that had copyrighted music and movies and, you know, who knows what else they wanted to shut down. And so that was soundly defeated thanks to an enormous outcry of people all over the Internet and progressive activists. And now we're seeing a similar kind of bill, but not from Hollywood, but this time it's from the Pentagon. And instead of just letting the government censor the Internet, the idea behind the bill is to allow the government to spy on the Internet as well. So basically, the military will be given control over key portions of the Internet and will be allowed to access all sorts of personal, private information without going through the normal privacy safeguards. And, you know, they didn't like him talking like that. When the profiteers in Hollywood and corporate America tried to wall up and censor the Internet last year with SOPA and PIPA, activists needed a spark to fight back against the assault on the free and open web, and Aaron Schwartz was there. The Internet trailblazer and activist who had already contributed such things to the web as an early version of the RSS feed and Reddit stood up and joined the vanguard in this movement. He co-founded the organization Demand Progress, which was instrumental in leading the largest online protest in the history of the Internet against SOPA and PIPA. Thanks to this effort, on January 18, 2012, tens of thousands of websites blacked out, and ultimately SOPA and PIPA were defeated by this online, online grassroots activism. Today, that same Internet is blacked out with remembrances and obituaries of Aaron Schwartz, who took his life over the weekend. And in each of those remembrances, Aaron is described as a spark that made things happen. And for the rest of us who still believe, as Aaron did, in a free and open Internet and a compassionate and just nation, a message he just often, he often espoused on our, on our show, we can only hope he provides the same sort of spark in death that he did in life. He was never afraid to talk about the depression he battled most of his life, often giving eloquent and deeply personal insight into how difficult it is to fight that disease. Ultimately, Aaron lost his battle with depression, just like so many other Americans who never received the help they needed in a nation that doesn't consider health care, especially mental health care, a basic human right. But the depression alone didn't kill Aaron. In a statement released over the weekend, Aaron's family placed the blame on our Department of Justice, which was prosecuting Aaron for an incident that happened back on the campus of MIT back in 2011. Aaron snuck into a utility closet on MIT's campus, plugged a computer into the network, and began downloading millions of academic journals that were stored behind a paywall belonging to the online database JSTOR. Allen likely knew that this was illegal. Although the expert witness for Aaron's defense, Alex Stamos, argues that Aaron's actions may not have been criminal after all. Regardless, Aaron was an activist who was willing to challenge the status quo of corporate welfare copyright laws that restrict the free flow of information from academic journals to mu music to movies on the Internet, and he was willing to blur the lines of legality in that effort. In fact, Aaron was acting in the spirit of Thomas Jefferson, who himself was not too keen on the idea of heavy-handed patents on ideas and intellectual properties. As Jefferson wrote in 1813, quote, that ideas should spread freely from one to another over the globe for the moral and mutual instruction of man and improvement of his condition seems to have been peculiarly and benevolently designed by nature when she made them, like fire, expansible over all space without lessening their density at any point and like the air in which we breathe, move, and have our physical being, incapable of confinement or exclusive appropriation, end quote. Jefferson then concluded, inventions then cannot, in nature, be a subject of property. Society may give an exclusive right to the profits arising from them as an encouragement to men to pursue ideas which may produce utility, but this may or may not be done according to the will and convenience of the society without claim or complaint from anybody. End of quote. Given the activism we've seen on the Internet over the last few years, one could conclude that just as Jefferson described, Patent and copyright laws should be changed according to the will and convenience of the society. To quote Je Jefferson, this was one of Aaron's pursuits. That's not to justify Aaron's crime, but instead to put it in some much-needed context. There are gray-haired lawmakers in corporate suits writing laws that no longer make sense, 
given how the vast majority of this new generation actually uses the Internet. And arguably, we're nearing a tipping point in which this disconnect will be untenable. This might explain why the Department of Justice reacted to Aaron's MIT antics in the way that it did. Rather than seed ground in this upcoming struggle, the powers that be decided to squash the struggle from the get-go by making an example out of Aaron. Despite it being a victimless crime and JSTOR itself settling the matter with Aaron, the Department of Justice threw the book at him. He was charged with multiple crimes and faced the possibility of serving decades in prison, a harsher punishment than most killers, bank robbers, child pornographers, and terrorist sympathizers get. Secret Service even involved itself in the matter. And at the urging of the U.S. Attorney for the Massachusetts District, Carmen Ortiz, Aaron was looking at the very real possibility of spending much of the rest of his life in prison. As Aaron's family said in a statement, his death was the result of, quote, an exceptionally harsh array of charges carrying potentially over 30 years in prison to punish an alleged crime that had no victims, end quote. Aaron was an activist, not a murderer. The punishment for his crime should have, been ref should have reflected that reality, but it didn't. In instead, Aaron was dogged to death by an overzealous Justice Department that targets activists and whistleblowers with all its fury while turning a blind eye to actual criminals, thieves, and murderers on Wall Street and in corporate America. This is the same sort of prosecutorial overreach we're now getting used to in a, na in a nation that more and more resembles a police state. It's a nation where soldiers like Bradley Manning, whistleblowers like John Kirikow, politicians like former Alabama Governor Don Siegelman, who dared to take on Karl Rove, and medical marijuana growers receive the full brunt of the American justice system and suffer dearly for their crimes or non-crimes. But at the same time, banksters who steal billions and corporate executives who are responsible for the death of their employees on oil rigs and in mine shafts, they never see a day in jail. This is a screwed up system. We need to do something about it. Hopefully, Aaron Schwartz's life and death will be an awakening moment for all of us.